welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Chaz Fisher of Fisher Blade Company. If his name sounds familiar, maybe it's because Chaz was a guest on the show a little over a year and a half ago as general manager of Boker USA. Since then, Chaz left Boker, moved to Montana, and established a new knife company with bro brother and knife maker John Fisher. Fisher Blade Company's first release is an aggressive and practical pocket carry fixed blade, but it's not your average EDC. We'll let Chaz explain and describe his experience traversing the knife landscape from huge corporate manufacturer to small batch producer. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And of course, download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can listen on the go. And if you want to help support the show, you can do so by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Chaz, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's good to have you back. And under these circumstances, I want to congratulate you for, um, I know you didn't just form Fisher Blades, but you're really in a, in a current phase of blossoming. Congratulations, sir. Well, thanks. It's, it's been a huge amount of fun and it's uh, uh, great to re-engage with a bunch of the, the people in the knife community, people like you. Uh, so it's, it's really cool to be back at it. Slinging blades, slinging blades. Well, uh, Fisher Blades is doing some really cool stuff, and a lot of it is very up my alley. And uh, some of the some of the other uh, people on YouTube who like the kind of knives I like are responding um, very positively uh, to this knife. Uh, but before we get to that and Fisher Blades, I, I do want to mention, as I mentioned in the intro, you were at Boker USA, which is a you know Boker is a giant. Uh, age-old company, uh, as far as corporations go. Um, how uh, let's let's uh, wrap up the chapter from the last time we spoke, and how did things go with Boker? Things were great with Boker. Uh, you know, I was brought in uh, when when Boker really needed some guidance in the U.S. and needed some strategic planning about how to take it to the next level. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the the founder of the company had had really built it up from nothing. Uh, and done a, he had done an extraordinary job, you know, taking it to where it is in the U.S. And uh, I think he he needed some relief, and I think he needed uh, sort of an American perspective to uh, to lay out some plans for how Booker was going to get to that next level. And so that was really the role that I filled. Uh, I came in, and I I did fill that. Uh, you know, I I created a plan that uh, uh, was maybe a bit uh, on the bold side for them. <laughs> Uh, because I think they're a bit conservative, which is fine. And, and I respect that and appreciate it. And, uh, you know, that, uh, once that was done, it left room for me to, uh, to move on and for them to move on. And, uh, I, I think that they're doing a great job of, of, uh, of fulfilling their potential in the marketplace. They're, they're really very, very strong in a few categories. Uh, and I admire that a lot. Yeah. I, I admire the company a lot too, for, a couple of reasons, one of which uh, the very first switchblade I ever had, uh, my brother got for me when he went to Germany when we were in high school in the 80s. That was a boker. And uh, and then my all time grail folder is a Charles Marlowe knife. And there's no way I'm ever going to have a real one. So I, I have the squail and that and that uh, hooks me up. So I like I like how they have their tentacles out everywhere. Yeah, um, it, it seems like from what I've seen there, uh, definitely a. Um, moving towards a more EDC kind of like, and I love that bringing as much people, as many people into the knife carrying world as possible um, is good to me. And a lot of the times you have to approach it in a gentle way. Uh, but I do know something about you. You are a lifelong martial artist. You're a hunter. You're an outdoorsman. Um, you like knives for a variety of reasons. And a big one is that sort of tactical and self-defense role. Um, uh so I, I feel like that's a, a huge part of what you're doing now. How how was that 
uh, part of your transition uh, away from the larger corporations and into your own um, company? Well, it's uh, what it does. Those, and I do have you know a few very deep interests, you know, and, and uh, martial training, you know, unarmed and armed uh, and armed uh, combative training has been a part of my life for probably 30 years, you know, maybe even longer. Uh, but there are other things that I do too. Like you mentioned, you know, I'm a, a very keen hunter. So uh, I think that what, uh, what we're trying to do with Fisher Blades is really hew very closely to a purpose first design uh, philosophy in the knives that we make. I think that one of the one of the issues that bigger brands have, and I saw it at SOG, I've seen it at many brands, not even, you know, not just knife brands. Uh, one of the problems they can have as big organizations is that they compromise in order to achieve market reach. And they'll take a product that might be very specialized and very, very purpose designed, and they'll start making compromises so that it will appeal to a broader group of people. Hmm. And Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but that's not something that that I wanted to do, nor that my brother wants to do. And so we decided to make, you know, we've got three pillars that Fisher Blades rests on, and one of those pillars is purpose first design. So everything that we, every knife that we make, really starts with defining what is that knife's purpose. Now the purpose could be one thing, or it could be many things. The purpose could be EDC, which is many things, or it could be like in the case of the Beckwith Covert. Uh, self-defense, you know, er, you know, a, a daily defensive daily carry knife. So uh, it's really informed how we're approaching the, the knives that we are designing and then producing. Now, you mentioned your brother, uh, John Fisher, um, who, from what I know, man of adventure type like yourself uh, <laughs> yeah. and, a, and a knife maker. Um, making some beautiful handmade outdoors knives. Now, he was the man that you partnered up with uh, to do Fisher Blades. And, well, that's very convenient because he has the last same name. But more than that, the two of you must share uh, a lot being brothers. I know my brother and I, though we're very different, just have a lot. Tell me about uh, the decision to partner up with him and uh, how that how that all came to pass. Well, you know, we've been talking about it for years. We've, we've shared, uh, you know, our ideas about ideal knives. And, you know, of course, we've had many adventures and misadventures with each other uh, over the years. Um, and so I'd say that, you know, if, if uh, my brother and I were a Venn diagram, we'd have a, an area of great overlap, but then some individual areas that uh, are unique to each of us. And uh, the more we talked about knives and what we wanted to do, we each wanted to do with our knives, we realized that that area of overlap was significant enough to uh, to leverage so that we could work together and you know make a product that we could, we could each uh, buy into. Uh, but that the the non overlap presented opportunities for us to uh, leverage the whole thing, and you know that might sound kind of you know, corporatees, some of that language, but it's true, right? You know, I, I don't have, you know, my brother's a big dual sport uh, adventure bike rider and I've, I've done some of it, but not like what he has done. And he's what is just, that? I mean, you go out into the back country, you know, into single track or double track, you know, single track in his case and do multiple day trips in the back country on a motorcycle. Wow. And, uh, um, you know, he's, he's done a lot of that. And so he's incredibly experienced in the back country on a, on a bike and a, a motorcycle. And, um, you know, I don't have that. And, you know, of course he doesn't have my martial training that, that I, I bring to it, but we each love knives and we each, uh, we each are very, um, we're devoted to this idea that a, a tool, whatever the tool is, should have a really well-defined purpose. Otherwise, it's going to be too much of a compromise. Every, mm -hmm. every tool really is a compromise, but uh, you want to, I, we want to minimize that. We want to really do a good job of defining how it's going to be used and design what we think is going to be just right for that purpose. So like I said, that's one of our three pillars that, that well, we that, uh, operate under. That's the perfect uh, segue. What are the three pillars? Well, purpose first design, uh, as I mentioned, um, batch production quality is another, and mm -hmm. I can talk about that in a minute and made in the USA or not at all. So, uh, the batch quality thing, 
uh, and you and I have had some discussions about this before. We uh, in our in our production line because we you know my brother makes handmade knives too, but in these these production knives that we're making, they are done in batches and they're fairly small batches. You know, several hundred to you know you know no more than a thousand in a batch and. Uh, what that allows us to do is really scrutinize every single knife that 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 gets shipped out. I mean, it goes through both of our hands multiple times, checking it for quality, checking it for you know every everything that we we do to those blades from the uh, you know from the 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 laser cut to the the blade grind, you know to the the scale fit to the edge, you know I mean everything everything gets many eyes on it many times. And so we were, are able to catch stuff that a big company just simply does. It doesn't have the hmm. resources to do that. It can't with the kind of quantities that they are that they're dealing with. So we think that 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 batches and we're not, of course, the only ones doing that. A lot of people are doing it uh, and they're, that's good because I think it makes for some really good quality. So what's the benefit of going batch to batch? Uh well, it makes for some discrete sets of knives that you don't, you know, we're not making thousands of them and then then picking or, or having thousands of them made. You know, we mm -hmm. we uh, we shepherd it through the whole through the whole process. We don't do everything in house, but uh, we we, you know, shepherd everything through every step of the process. Uh, we're not getting thousands of knives and then pulling, say, a percentage of them, single digit percentage to check for seconds or check for problems. Mm -hmm. And then assuming every knife in that in that batch, or you know, in that bigger batch, is uh, is good to go. Uh, so it, it gets many eyes, or eyes on it many times, hands on it many times, and so we're not checking. Yeah, we're checking a percentage of our blades, and it's a hundred percent. That's a huge difference from uh, where you were before, so oh, whether it's dog or Boker, because yeah. their numbers are giant. And yeah. yeah, I never, I never really thought about that, but they're looking at a small percentage of yeah. what they're letting out the door and assuming yeah. uh, that everything in between is just as good. Yeah. And that's always a roll of the dice. You know, it can go really well or it can go really, really wrong. And I've seen it go wrong. And of course I've seen it go well, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's not something we, we want to roll the dice on. Uh, something I like about the batch, um, uh, batch production uh, concept is that it allows for um, nimbleness in between batches. Uh, mm -hmm. Say you discover, uh, oh, I don't like the length of this guard, or we need to change the angle, grind, whatever it is. Yeah. You can do it between batches. You're not married to 10,000 of the same type. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I, I mean, I can give you an example of that. Of that. Uh, Beck with Covert, uh, you know, which you've been had in your hands and you've been using, uh, we were discovering that a certain amount of these sheaths uh, had some issues with fit, and uh, you know, not a whole lot of handle is is uh, inside that sheath. And mm -hmm. so, for this next batch that that we're running, which is being run right now, uh, we we just increased that dimension enough so that there's more of the uh, the handle inside the sheath, and we've completely eliminated that problem. And it wasn't a problem that found its way to the user. Uh, it was really a problem with rejects that we had with our sheaths, which, you know, mm. of course we don't want. And, uh, uh, you know, that benefited us. But at some point, you know, we are going to, I'm sure, make an improvement to this that will benefit the uh, the user. Okay. Well, since you just showed it, let's talk about the Beckwith Covert. The first knife um, from Fisher Blades in, in its um, current mm -hmm. formation, let's say, with, with you and... John together. And uh it's a beauty. It is a pocket fixed blade self-defense knife. Take it from here. Okay. So uh we started with what is its purpose? And its purpose is to be carried in the pocket. Uh its primary purpose, uh, you know, as as a blade is to be used in self-defense. And uh from there, kind of all the decisions about how big it was, what kind of what kind of blade shape we were using, even what, what kind of steel, what the scales were going to be, all of that sort of uh, uh, radiated from that first defining of what the purpose of the knife was. Um, uh, we knew it wanted, we wanted a fixed blade, by the way, because we didn't want to have to go into uh, 
into a folder right away. You know, we might do that later, but we're not going to do it now. So it had to be fixed. Um, in order for it to be comfortable in the pocket and be worn every day, it can't be gigantic. You know, you, we're, we're not talking about a four to six inch blade. We're not talking about a handle that's enormous. Uh, we, uh, you know, it needs to fit in there. And uh, I was pretty adamant that the pocket not be made obsolete for other things, meaning, you know, that's <laughs> not the only thing in the pocket. I wanted people to be able to use their pockets for other things because anything that's a disincentive to carrying that knife uh, eventually is going to wear you down and you're going to say, ah, that thing is too big. It's too bulky. I can't put my keys in my front pocket and that's where I want them or whatever. And they're going to not carry it. And that's then it's not fulfilling its purpose, <laughs> right? Its purpose yeah. uh, was supposed to have been uh, to, to protect you if something went wrong. So um, uh, that's where we started. Uh, it ended up being about seven inches. We wanted full hand grip. Uh, mm -hmm. That was important to us uh, because for self-defense, you, you know, three fingers is just not a lot and not enough. And uh, it helped define uh, or establish or inform what blade shape we, we put on it. And, you know, as you know, and we've discussed, it's got a uh, sort of a modified, I think some, some folks call this a, an American Tonto. Um, and I do call it a Tonto, not a Tanto. Uh, Somebody recently on YouTube reprimanded me for that, but it's it's tanto, it's not tanto. Um, yeah. And the reason for the, the the tanto blade is that after having done some pretty extensive pig carcass testing with different knives over the years, uh, I just did another one the other day, by the way. Uh, I found that the intersection of the proximal edge here and the distal edge here—that's what we call those. The intersection of those is what we call the Tonto intersection. And when you're using this knife, the way it's designed with the thumb ramp to push as you're slashing, you get a huge concentration of force at that intersection and you get greater uh, greater cut depth on that. And so that's, that's why the Tonto blade shape came about. Um, and then the, the thumb ramp is there for that articulation. The geometry of the blade is is uh, there to facilitate that, right? So it's it's not just a straight across knife, right? It's got a it goes that way, mm -hmm. and that facilitates the articulation as well. Uh, the angle of the the distal edge to the spine is acute enough so that you know when required and you're having to stab into organic matter, you get good penetration there as well. The Finger guard is there to protect the hands. Uh, and I think I might have discussed this with you at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. In one of my carcass testing uh, encounters, uh, I stabbed into a carcass, knife cut the one of the vertebrae uh, into a very sharp edge. My hand went all the way into that cut mm. and uh, sliced my finger open to the bone. And I thought, yeah, I, I think I'd really like a finger guard <laughs> on, on the next knife that I... Uh, that I might have to stab organic matter with. And so that's why the finger guard is there. Uh, and the, uh, the quillin, which is what I call this, is also called quillian. And there are other, other terms for this kind of hooky thing here. That's there to facilitate the draw when you draw the knife out. So you get an indexed draw on the knife, uh, ready to go. You don't have to reposition it in your hand. Uh, one thing I like about, uh, Quillian, I, I always say Quillian, so I'll use that. But uh, the Quillian here, and then this bump on the back uh, gives you a great pinch point. Of course, uh, I like to pull it reverse a lot. Uh, yeah. But uh, either either way, it gives you something on the other side so that yeah. you're not, uh, so that it's evened out. I like that bump here. It's a subtle uh, addition, uh, but something uh, I, I guess I haven't seen too much of. Uh, and, and I think it's uh, valuable. Yeah, well, I mean, you're you're absolutely right about that. Uh, one of the things that that uh, I tried to focus on a lot on on this knife in particular was the draw, and a, and a lot of people, you know, even even combative knife guys who do a lot of training in this, do a lot of work using the blade, train a lot using the blade mm -hmm. uh, with a trainer or an actual blade, uh, and they don't put as much energy into the draw, and. Uh, I know with some of my other armed uh, combatives work that I have done uh, with with firearms that 
you know, getting getting that thing out and in play is that's step one. <laughs> it almost doesn't matter how well you can. It doesn't matter how well you can use that thing, whatever that tool is. If you can't get it into play, you know, it just simply doesn't matter. You're 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 in trouble. And so being able to draw and draw uh, reliably pre-indexed so that there's no moving around on the thing after you pull it out. Uh, so you don't have to. I mean, you could mm -hmm. if you I guess if you wanted to. Uh, that was incredibly important to me. So that's why the the knife sits at its height in the pocket. That's why the quillion is there. That's why the bump. Uh, you're exactly right for uh, for reverse grip draw. That mm -hmm. turned out to be actually an important part of that when you're gripping like this to pull out or edge out reverse, or, you know, or even edge in reverse. You still you want it there. It facilitates it. Uh, that's also why we put jimping in this area. Uh, I know it's hard to see, but in this area as well as this area so that uh, you, you get even that added security to it as well. Um, the You told me something very interesting when we were talking about this knife uh, on the phone, and you were talking about some R&D you did with uh, someone that you train who's uh, way better at you in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You're teaching him... Um, I'm not sure what you're teaching him, but he's, he's like, oh, his expertise is BJJ. You guys got together, we're sparring, we're rolling, and you had the trainer for this in your yeah. pocket. Tell me about how that worked out and how it influenced your design after that moment. Yeah, well, first off, I'm a striker, not a grappler, not a submission guy. But I use this student because he is he is uh, he's pretty proficient at uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so, and he knows how to tie me up. And uh, so we were playing around, and I just wanted – I was curious about the access – uh, my access to that blade, uh, you know, I needed to test the the whole theory of front pocket, you know, kind of laterally located front pocket, and um, and so I just said, hey, you know, put put me in a variety of, of positions that I'm going to hate. Let me see if I can reach uh, reach this knife, and I don't even honestly know what happened, but he uh, he got me in a position where my knee actually was up against my chest. And the, the, the way that that particular um, that prototype sheath was for that for that trainer knife, it, it, it sat straight up in the pocket and it, mm. it kind of bumped right up into my hip flexor. Hmm. And when my knee was at my chest, I could not access the knife. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> this is a, this is a problem. I got to change that. Right. I got to fix that. And so that's when I introduced a slight cant, you know, like on this side, if, if I'm carrying on this side, I canted the uh, I canted the pommel of the knife slightly this way so that it just rides just barely outboard of the crease of my uh, leg to the to the pelvis so that when my knee is at my chest now I have access to the pommel so so that's, I, that's I, why we ended up with that I I absolutely love that story I love hearing that kind of um, research and development kind of story. Uh, especially when it comes out of uh, some sort of um, organic situation like that. Oh, let's let's roll around. Let me see if I can still. And then boom. Oh, I didn't think of this. I have to angle the handle. And that has been the one uh, non-starter for me with the reverse grip. You know, I, I've said many times I like that reverse grip carry. Uh, but that's the one thing I've become aware of is that it does angle inward. So, yeah. you know, maybe if I get in a jiu-jitsu match i better have another <laughs> knife on me somewhere else if i'm carrying well, that way you know it's uh you can't solve for every problem right and exactly. uh i i realize that there is uh no matter what antidote you're you're designing and you know, let's face it that's what this is this is an antidote to to something yeah. and that antidote is not going to 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 cure every every problem that you might encounter and so there are a lot of different ways that people can carry this knife. There are a lot of different ways that they can utilize it. They can draw it. And, you know, really, if you, li if you like uh, reverse grip, you know, edge out or edge in, uh, figure out a way where you can get it uh, the most times, mm -hmm. uh, the easiest way. And, and we're, we're on board with that. You know, we're developing some other, some other carry options for this knife. Uh, some are belt, some are inside the waistband, uh, some are appendix. Uh, so we, we've got some more coming in terms of sheath options for that knife so that to accommodate just, you know, people like you. 
Well, I actually, I appreciate that. Cause I, who doesn't love options, but, um, I've also, uh, grown to love, dra uh, not even grown. I mean, pretty much immediately love drawing this in this, um, edge in pick call mm -hmm. reverse grip. Uh, the handle yeah. is set up perfectly for it. My hand, which is uh, medium by all accounts fits perfectly in the handle. Um, so, so to me, it's like, like you said, you can't solve for everything and, and not every, you know, you buy a screwdriver and, and a regular one is not the kind that can get into that little corner under the sink. Exactly. You get so, yeah. a specialized tool for that. But, but what you want to do is make a tool or, or in this case, a knife that fits the most amount of situations. Mm -hmm. And I think this with the pocket carry goes uh, a, a great length to doing that. Um, Describe to me why on the on your first outing you went you went pocket carry. I understand why you went fixed blade, mm -hmm. but I want to talk about that too. Fixed blade versus folder, but also why the pocket carry? Well, you know, I'll reveal one of my own biases, and that is that for a knife that I am going to have on me every day that whose purpose is self-defense. And just the way I live my life, you know, I, I, I really mostly spend it in urban areas and uh, mm -hmm. walking around with two fixed blade knives on my belt is just not it's not an easy thing for me to do. I mean, I could do it, you know, but uh, it would be a little awkward. Stuff would get caught because I'm getting in and out of cars and seat belts and, you know, carrying a pack and, and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted what I wanted was something that would not interfere with my life the way I mostly live it. And uh, pocket carry really was was ideal for that. And I'm not against uh, belt carry at all. It's uh, you know, I, I do belt carry knives for for other reasons. But for for daily carry, it needs to be something that you're going to be able to do literally every day. You know, you should mm -hmm. not leave home without it, in my view. And uh, like I said, any disincentive to carrying it every day, you know, eventually you're going to give in to that. You're going to leave it at home. And, you know, who knows, that might be the one day in your life yeah. that you need that thing. And because uh, it doesn't happen very often, you know, to, it might not have ever happened to any of us. But if it happens to me, I want access to that thing. I, I've experimented uh, in my life recently uh, with carrying kind of ridiculously large knives. Um and and in my case, they've been concealed, and 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 that lasts about half a day. And then I'm like, ah, this is totally uncomfortable. Like, can't make this work. Uh, but if you have it on your belt and you're the guy walking around town with two knives on your belt, then you're that guy. And yeah. we we also have to, you know, uh, we we all love knives, but we also don't want to alienate ourselves and other people, and we want to blend mm -hmm. in a little bit. We don't want to be. And I I I I've seen pocket carry before in various ways um but i i uh pocket carry for for fixed blades and mm -hmm. i think that it is the way to normalize fixed blades because everyone carries anyone who carries a knife daily has it in their pocket most likely already and mm -hmm. and most likely they have it clipped to the to their pocket so it's a very short uh distance between that and this and this is not it, this is way more illegal than people think people have this assumption that fixed blades are less legal than folders. And actually it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can get away with this in way more jurisdictions across the country than a folder. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's, it, it can get kind of complex and, you know, it's of course different by state and even municipality. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, one of the big, one of the things to look out for if you're trying to follow the law is concealability is concealedness and the knife is concealed there are many states and and jurisdictions where just it being concealed whether it's a folder or fixed is a uh, is a problem and um and so you know for example in seattle where you know i spend the majority of my time uh Fixed blades are not illegal, but a but concealed fixed blades are problematic. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, I wanted to avoid that. I you know, not, I don't want to encourage people to to break the law. Um, so having that, you know, having both the clip vis visible and you know the pommel of the knife visible, you know, automatically. Well, it's not concealed; it's there. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. 
And so that was a consideration as well. That was another reason for that pocket carry is that if it is on your belt and you've got something covering it, well, technically, you know, uh, you know, the, the cops could get you for concealing that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I don't want that to happen to people who live in a place like Seattle, for example. Mm -hmm. So you're you're pretty strident in talking about how this knife is a um, self defense knife. It's uh, for for um, getting you know for, it's for the worst situation. It's a tactical thing. Um, tell me, and let me just head this off. I got to say, it also makes because I'm not getting in fights often, and because the heat treat on this is awesome, and I'm not really worried about damaging it i use it for edc tasks it happens mm -hmm. to be great and i i hope i'm not disappointing you in saying <laughs> no, so it, it does no. make a great everyday carry knife i mean the blade shape is perfect for so many things um yeah. but tell me tell me about the philosophy uh, like behind the blade and and how you feel about edc stuff yeah i'll tell you how i feel i i'm i'm okay with it i've come to peace with it you're not the first person to do it my brother has actually been edcing it and using it to open boxes and you know, I gotta shake, I gotta shake my head to death. <laughs> but hey, it's uh, it's how he wants to use it, and that's fine. I, I do think that the Tonto is really cool. That 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 Tonto intersection makes for a great box opener because mm -hmm. you know you're not poking you know the tip of the blade in, and you just get to cut the tape and edges. Uh, I I think that if people want to use it for that, sure, go for it. Uh, if, however, you're serious about the self defense thing. I would encourage people at the very least to get good at sharpening it because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a dull blade, it could still do some damage, obviously. Uh, but a really dull blade, you know, it might make the difference between, uh, you know, what you're trying to achieve with that bad person and, uh, you know, between achieving it and not achieving it. Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, you know, because we've talked about this, both of my, blades that are self-defense blades and you know these days it's the the covert i don't use for anything else they're you know they're you know, i sharpened them my brother sharpened um you know a whole bunch of them and i sharpened a few and um uh they never they don't get used for anything so i know 100 percent i'm not dealing with any sort of problem with that edge uh on your instagram page you have a picture of a leather biker jacket that's been slashed up by one of these i'm not sure if, <laughs> if it was by you or by a customer uh but it really shows the power of of well that you you call it the tonto intersection but mm -hmm. uh you know how well this thing slashes and uh leather is one of those materials that um you could slip off of easily uh if you if you've got if your edge is not in in the right condition so i do understand your uh philosophy of keeping it sharp keeping it clean and keeping it ready to go uh, so that you can do that you know yeah that that's a that actually was a pretty thick leather jacket that we put on a pig carcass for pig testing and so uh we were testing the covert's ability to penetrate that that leather uh and and how effective it was both at, at uh thrusts and stabs as well as uh penetrating cuts and it, it did very, very well. It was a sharp, it was a fresh, a fresh edge. Okay. No. Uh, so I, I have never, unfortunately, and I'd like to, I would love to do this at some point, but I've never done that. Um, pig testing live, you know, uh, fleshy testing kind of stuff. Um, what did you, what have you learned from that sort of testing? That is, uh, you're, you're stabbing and slashing, knives to test them into a pig carcass that's moving and dynamic and everything. What kind of things did you learn from that? And did anything you learned from that go into the design of the Beckwith covert? Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, the, uh, the finger guard is there very specifically because of a, a, right. a mishap, uh, with, you know, prior test. And, um, what I have learned is that if you if you do have a, a good edge, and I did not test it with a with a bad edge, with a with a blunt edge, and that that could be the subject of another test and you know another YouTube video, if they let me put it up. The uh, what I've learned is it it's uh, it it does its job. The it it gets through. You know that that uh, that jacket that you saw really cut to ribbons. Underneath that was a, a pretty thick uh, cotton uh, um, hoodie. 
that we put underneath it as well, which probably did a little bit more to prevent penetration by the blade than even the leather did. Huh. So uh, I think that what I learned is that I, if, if I have a clear path to what my, my target is, I, I would still prefer to penetrate cut versus stab. And I would prefer it because I think I can get better access to uh, um, those parts of the body where I can get pretty you know, a, a faster effect mm -hmm. than than with a stab. A stab, you know, you're good, you're, you can miss a lot. You your target your targeting has got to be really really good with a stab. Yeah, right, right. Because yeah, even it, even if even if it's to this area, you, you basically have to pinpoint it. Whereas with a with a slash especially with that downward raked straight edge and the the point the secondary point and all that uh you can you can do a lot of damage in in this kind of long cut or or a cut yeah. that's even 3 inches or or whatever because it's going to be sort of a um sort of a thrust at the same time too it's going to be that's the thing about a tanto you're piercing and cutting at the same time yeah. Yeah, there are two there are two things that are going to happen with a with an effective thrust slash slab penetrating cut. They you know, are two two benefits that can be achieved. And one is that you render that limb that is being if it's a limb that you're you're cutting, you can render that limb unusable by cutting tendon and and muscle. You can completely sever, in fact, uh, and you can also get to uh, you know where where the blood is pumping and get massive leakage and that of course produces a very quick effect if you're if you're cutting if you're severing the right uh the right thing i want to be careful not to say too much here because i don't want you to get censored yeah yeah, yeah. It, and and you know it's a tool for a purpose and but sometimes yeah, yeah that that can uh but okay, so uh, I also want to talk a little bit about this thumb ramp which mm. um i asked you kind of about this on the phone also and um you mentioned an interesting and surprising uh, influence for that tell me about that yeah well i mean i'll, I'll make no i, I don't want to make any secret about uh, where i've gotten inspiration and gotten ideas from i think that's the way people innovate is they take something that they've liked or disliked about something and they do their best to improve it and i don't i don't know that if i've done that with this but i certainly was influenced by spider co's thumb ramp uh and they're not they didn't they didn't invent the thumb ramp but they they have done a very good job with with some of their blades in uh in the right geometry for that and so i you know i've grown to really like that and so i wanted to i wanted to have that in this knife because i think it works so well for what i was trying to do with the blade which is yeah. to give it some penetration potential and to protect the thumb on um you know on thrusts and stabs because it does well, help. It does help to do that. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean that that is your. Um, it's like your front sight in a way on this knife, mm -hmm. and um, you know when you mentioned the Delica a while ago, and I, I love that reference because we all know the Delica as a great EDC do everything mm -hmm. little knife, but I also think it happens to be a great, um, you know, in a pinch sort of knife for that kind of bad thing oh, we're talking about yeah. and um uh, the only thing it does lack and i have experience because i cut nearly to the bone with a an endura it lacks the finger guard down here you can have the mm -hmm. the thumb engaged all day long uh but in a moment of weakness you're gonna slip past that your thumb will still be engaged on the ramp but your finger can go up on so this combination <laughs> here is ideal uh but but anyway getting back to that ramp the thing about this ramp that uh and and maybe the delicas that um i think makes it most effective is that the ramp ascends to the to the peak of the spine and then the spine continues it's not a ramp that comes up and then dips back down and then mm -hmm. you have the spine back here so you're you're you've got a lot of leverage when you're when you're slashing with it and, and exerting any pressure on the thumb ramp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, uh, tell me about the arc in the back of the handle here. Yeah. Well, what we we're looking for, you know, it, and we haven't talked about the, the flat scales part of this yeah. yet. Um, and, and I might as well, because the, the flat scales were really a necessary part of what we wanted because, you know, one, we wanted it to be thin enough to carry and to have it not be, you know, a big, 
bummer in your pocket all the time because it's too bulky. Um, but I also found in an earlier prototype that we made of this that had more of a, a lot more radius to the scales is that even with the indexing that I had of the finger guard and the, the, the quillion in the back here and the thumb, even then, and if I wasn't looking at it, there were times when I wasn't entirely sure where that edge was, you know, where it was oriented. And so uh, when I flattened the scales there, it just left no doubt when you, when you hold this knife, where's my edge, what direction is it oriented in? You know, it's not, oh, it's not over here Yeah. <laughs> if, because you know, when I'm holding it, that flatness uh, orients it. And so that's why the flat scales. Uh, once we did those, we realized that we're going to need some volume to the, to the, uh, grip itself to make it more stable in the hand to mm. have it not roll as you're as you're holding on to it. Yeah. So this hump at the top and the sort of palm swell down here help uh, st stabilize that in the hand so that uh, you get a very good grip on it. So that's yeah. why those things are there. Yeah, it turns it kind of into a triangle. Like uh, mm -hmm. to me, the the flat scales are most valuable for well, as you said, indexing the edge, but also. Um, under pressure, it's not going to turn, at least not as easily in your hand. Mm -hmm. And I think you were mm -hmm. just alluding to that. Uh, but when you add that hump, you're basically taking something relatively two dimensional and adding that third dimension and making it mm -hmm. kind of triangular. And yeah. uh, that stops it from from turning. Um, so let's let's talk about. So you said proudly made and entirely made in the United States. How are they made? Uh, well, they're they're made the way most uh, production knives are made. You know, you start with flat stock. You get that lasered out. You know, it's stock removal. Um, but, and it, you know, this is a, eighty CRV, right? No, it's um, oh, I mean ADL. I was yeah. Mixed up in my mind. And um, and so they get they get you know cut out by laser, and then uh, um, you know, we will be adding another step after that. You know, for subsequent runs, but uh, then they get uh, heat treated, and then they get uh, thickness ground, and then they get blade gr ground, and uh, and then they get seracoded, and then they get put, you know, sharpened and put together. So that's the very brief process of what it goes through. So is this? I mean, does your brother put them together as the knife maker, or do you do you farm different parts of the process out uh, to different? Well, we we farm the process. We do farm out the uh, the you know we don't have a laser, so we're not doing our own laser cutting. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have uh, that that we don't have the blade grind capability, you know, yet. So that gets mm -hmm. farmed out. Uh, the heat treat we could do ourselves, um, but at you know even at the small batch runs that we're doing, it is more effective for us to to uh, uh, contract that out. The um, you know in Cerakote, you know, right now we're having somebody else do it. You know, that might change in the future, but but I, we have no reason to change it. Uh, for sure, the uh, the assembly, the sharpening and assembly happens in Montana. We both we both do that. Uh, both my brother and I are putting those things together. Yeah, this this is a model that I really appreciate, like a, a business model that I really appreciate because um, it takes your expertise and your brother's expertise, and then it draws in others from the local economy. And um, I mean, you do enough of this. And you start creating knife making towns, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. I can never remember the name of the t yeah, the the town in uh, the city in China that's got all the main manufacturers yeah. or like a Solingen or a, a, a mm -hmm. Sevilla. And uh, I, I love that. Um, I've spoken to a, a lot of different knife companies here that are in America that are keeping it American and they, they don't have all of the capabilities in house. But they're getting the stop pins from over here, and they get they're getting the steel from here, and the materials, and they're all made in America. And um, I mean, to me, uh, that that means a lot. Uh, what does it mean to you to have everything American made? Well, it's it's important, and as I said, it's it's you know the third pillar of of uh, you know the, that holds us up, and. Um, we we feel that way not because you know i'm not anti you know other countries you know I'm, yeah. I'm a patriotic guy and i love america and everything but it's you know i'm not uh i'm not 
anti really any other country, certainly not uh, ones that are currently our strong allies. Um, but I do have a bit of a problem with, uh, with stuff made in China and not because I have anything against the Chinese. I've spent a lot of time in China and I have many Chinese friends and I've trained in a Chinese martial art for, for mm -hmm. 30 years. So I have an affinity for it, but what I don't like and what my brother doesn't like, what we don't like is the, what's happening to the Chinese people by the government that's over there. And so I don't want to do anything that will support that, that will support that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's antithetical to what we're trying to do with, with the United States in terms of individual freedoms and, you know, civil rights. And uh, so what we're trying to do is just not support that, which is uh, antithetical to that, uh, that, that those core American values. So, I have no problem sourcing stuff, you know, out of Germany. I like, as I think I mentioned to you that the actual steel for this knife came from Germany. Um, but everything else, uh, came from here and was made here, you know, the scales, the, the screws, we had those screws made, uh, with, a, with us steel, uh, here in the States, uh, as an example. So, uh, what it means is just making a statement about that and, and holding true to those values. Which are which is very very hard to do, as I'm sure you know. Is yeah, there, it it does, and I will say very quickly, it has nothing to do with quality, really, uh, because but we all know there are some really high quality knives and other things coming out of China. I mean, they make they make the iPhone right, and they they do a very good job with that. They make some very good blades, uh, so it doesn't have to do with quality. I mean, we're not playing that game. Um, yeah. You know, we're not doing it for that reason. We're doing it because of, of a, I think, a values misalignment between uh, between that nation and what we have here. Uh, you know, when you say you had your screws made by U.S. Steel, uh, to me, that is one of the coolest things because, um, I mean, we think of, we look at we look at something like this, or I look at something like this, and I forget that even these little tiny grommets are parts that you have to source the screws, the grommets, the, the gaskets, everything on this, you have to source. And some of it you have made uh, in this case, you had the screws made and I don't know what else, but uh, the point is to me, keeping it all in house and by in house, I mean, in the United States and even down to the hardware, to the screws uh, to me, that's very exciting. And, and I know that there are, you know, companies who make their own screws and, and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I, something about that is very pleasing to me. And I like supporting a company that is all that is interested in keeping things here and not, yeah. not necessarily as a statement against anyone, but a statement for us here. We have yeah. a proud manufacturing past that we've turned our back on for a long time. And, you know, it's time we uh, turn back around and embrace it. And, when companies like yours do that, uh, warms the cockles of my heart. What can I say? Um, and, 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 and all the materials you've also mentioned all the materials. I mean, you could, you could easily be buying, um, Chinese G10 or whatever it is and saving a couple of shekels there. But, um, you yeah, know, but, we won't do but that. We making that, a, that, making that a pillar of your business, I think is, is important. Uh, I want to I want to double back on some of the um, self defense aspect of knives from your perspective. Um, uh, I, I've trained a lot in Filipino martial arts, and they have their whole knife philosophy. You've trained a lot in Chinese martial arts, which no doubt has their own knife philosophy and how weapons fit in. But tell me about fixed blades versus folders for self defense. And I will caveat by saying so many of us carry folders because they're easier and or, or we think they're easier and can more convenient to carry um but how in your mind does it play out in a self-defense scenario having a folder well a, a little bit of a caveat just to to make sure that we understand each other uh mm -hmm. yeah I've, I've trained wing chun you know for like i said about 30 years uh, Kung Fu, which is a Chinese Kung Fu. And they, they do have some weapons. There are we obviously there are a lot of weapons, uh, mm. um, a lot of weapons material in, in that, in those systems. 
but that's not where I've gotten the majority of my bladed stuff from. Mm. I've gotten it from more domestically sourced uh, sources, um, some former military guys that I've done a bunch of training with. And, uh, and so that's, that's where that comes. I did do a little bit of time with, uh, with Pinchak Salat. And so I'm mm. familiar with how they knew, use knives. What that did for me was just make me a lot more comfortable using a knife in a, in a, a dynamic environment. They're very mm -hmm. good at that. So uh, to the specific question about folders versus fixed, uh, I, I'm not anti-folder. I love folders. I, you know, you know that uh, <laughs> you know, I've, I've been working with them for years. Yeah. From a defensive standpoint, there is no question that a fixed blade is going to be better for you provided it's not an impediment in some other area, like not making you not want to carry it, or it's getting you in trouble with the law, or uh, or maybe it's too big to kind of use mm -hmm. in a confined space. <laughs> if uh, if you if you exclude all of those factors, no question, a fixed blade is going to be better for you because you don't have to open the blade. And like I mentioned before, the draw and deployment of a, of a blade of a blade or of any tool in a self defensive situation is the most important step. Well, it's the second most important step in that encounter. The first most important one was uh, trying to avoid getting in it. So you, yeah. <laughs> you made some mistakes or 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 maybe bad luck really is, is running against you and you find yourself in a bad situation. Uh, but if you made mistakes, that was sort of the first thing that you, you missed doing. Um, but then the second thing that you absolutely should not fail at uh, is if you need to use a tool self-defensively, you've got to get it into play. And uh, a fixed blade is ready to go. You do not have to open the blade. And opening the blade can be a very tough thing to do under duress. And it's not like, you know, it's not like the movies where you got a lot of space and a lot of time and you kind of, it's almost like mutual combat. You whip your knife out because yeah. they got their their knife or whatever it is that they're doing with you. Uh, you're You're often much more pressed for time and often also <laughs> pressed for space. Yeah. It's and not so, like DeMarco. I've been waiting for this knife fight all my <laughs> life. <laughs> right. Right. It's uh, it, it's, it's harrowing and it's, it could be very tightly confined spaces and uh, uh, having to actually, you know, not only draw it, but also deploy it just adds another step to it. Yeah. That's, that's why uh, for me, uh, I mean, I have tons of, folders that are way in that tactical realm and i love them all uh but uh, if i had to go out the door knowing that i might actually really for real need it it would be one of my emerson's with a wave or one of my cold steels with their version of it because mm -hmm. you draw it out of your pocket and there it is and you're not fussing with it trying to open it like all oh my god i'm in a knife fight worrying about it it's already deployed yeah. in your hand um um, but I, I, I will say, though, that I think that there are situations that could very easily call for relying on a folder for self-defense where, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's just really socially unacceptable for you to have a, uh, a fixed blade on you um, or, you know, usually it has something to do with that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that they, they shouldn't or couldn't be used for self-defense. Obviously, they can. That's the right place, right time. Right, right. And, and um, training definitely has, uh, and, and by training, I even mean just practicing deploying it and pulling oh, it out absolutely. of your, of your yeah. pants pocket and opening it. Um, yeah, it could have a, a huge part to do with it. And, uh, you know, maybe slowing yourself down a little bit. Um, but anyway, uh, I also wanted to talk about something. Um, so this is a beautiful EDC um, kind of fighting fixed blade knife or self-defense fixed blade knife. Uh, and it fits my hand perfectly. Um, and I'm a six foot tall guy with medium sized hands. It'll probably fit most people's hands, but have you had any uh, requests or interest in larger knives? Where are you going to take the Beckwith uh, in particular from here? Oh, that's a great question. And yes, we have had requests. Uh, we had them almost immediately. I think some of it has to do not necessarily with how big people's hands were, although that's mm -hmm. it's possible. Uh, but there were some people who just wanted a bigger, beefier blade. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've got a different use profile for it than we had kind of envisioned for the, the Beckwith Covert. But we do have at least two 
knives that we are developing, additional knives for the Beckwith family. So there'll be three knives in total. And the covert, of course, was the inaugural knife in that in that family. Uh, we will develop a slightly larger format for uh, for a fixed blade. And of course, it's not just going to be scaled up and, ex and precisely the same in every way because it's going to be carried differently. It's going to be deployed, you know, drawn and deployed differently. And so it will necessarily have some uh, changes made to its geometry and some of the features that we have in the knife, but it'll be recognizable as uh, as part of that Beckwith family. Okay. Uh, and then, and then uh, we do actually have a folder that's also in development oh, uh, cool. that uh, um, that we'll be coming out with, but later probably. But we yeah, I was I, I was going to ask you about. Sorry, I interrupted you. I was going to ask you: Will the consequent subsequent? Yeah, the subsequent blades have uh, the same profile. Will they be tantos and kind of have that same spirit of the original? Um, for this probably line. with it within the Beckwith line, probably mm -hmm. not necessarily, but probably. Uh, you know, we haven't thought beyond those three knives, uh, mm -hmm. and I don't want to. You know, we've we've got a lot of knife ideas, and it's not uh, constrained to just the you know how how we're conceiving the self defense or defensive space. We've got other knives that we're going to be doing as well, um, and so. Uh, yeah, I think even within the Beckwith family, there's probably room for some different blade styles. I still happen to think that that Tanto is uh, is ideal, mm -hmm. but maybe there are some people who, you know, who don't need to, you know, penetrate cut. You know, maybe that's not their style, and that's I, I'll respect that. Uh, we're going to only do it though if we think that it still will fulfill the stated purpose of that of that blade. Right. Uh We've gone this far and haven't mentioned, uh, for those who might not know, who who is uh, Colonel Charles Beckwith? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we haven't mentioned that at all. Uh, so Charlie Beckwith was a uh, uh, an American soldier, professional soldier, a career soldier, who um, is responsible. Back in the uh, very early 80s, late 70s and early 80s is when it started to come about. Uh, some, you know, they're, they've, they've become quite famous uh, in, a, in a hushed and quiet way because they don't like to call attention to themselves, but they've done some pretty major things over the years. And they're, unfortunately, one of the things they're, they're usually uh, uh, talked about in reference to is the failed uh, attempt to rescue our hostages in Iran when the Iran hostage crisis happened. Um, what they don't talk about, which I think is a really great sort of uh, way to cap that story, and it, you know that story is it, it resulted not in any deaths, I, I don't think, uh, but it failed, and you know we lost some aircraft and stuff like that. Uh, but what that what that and Charlie Beckwith was in charge of Delta for that that was their first major mission. It uh, it caused him to re-examine how we manage our special operations forces that we deploy and he his recommendation was um uh what basically became jsoc and uh which is a kind of a multi-departmental uh multi-branch way of managing special operations that had not been done before and the various stages that go into making those operations succeed like you know air support for example yeah. right yeah. Which is, you, you know had been the air force's domain before that and so those things were not very well coordinated for that particular iran mission and that's one of the reasons why it failed and so he was responsible for that recommendation to form jsoc anyway we just uh, i admired what he did i admired his tenacity and he fought for many many years to form delta force and encountered a lot of resistance, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of not invented here notions. And uh, he persevered and made it happen. And so I just, we, we wanted to, we named it after him in tribute, yeah, right? Uh, and to honor him. Something I always thought was, uh, uh, I read that book we talked about uh, by him or about him. I can't even remember if it was an autobiography. Uh, but uh, something I always liked about Delta Force was the fact that, um, and we know that the the military branches are very um, um, 
what can I say, tribal in a way, I guess. And he reached out to the best in all the different branches yeah. to form that. And to me, I think that's cool because that's uh, that's going outside of that tribalism, which even even today our law enforcement uh, agencies are prone to and just really getting the best of the best for the mission. And I always appreciated that. And I think that's a good spirit to imbue in the in this knife, this knife in particular, uh, because of what its mission is. Uh, I, b before we wrap, I have to ask you about the unicorn editions. <laughs> yeah. What are the unicorn yeah. editions? Well, well, uh, our batches, you know, we, we have batches and, and editions are kind of used interchangeably. So we, you know, we we talk about doing batches, and uh, as you know, because you have a blade, every batch is is uh, indicated on the blade in its laser etching, so you know what batch you got. And you know which knife number within that batch you got as well. Uh, so we're going to do two kinds of batches. One is what will be reruns, like this Beckwith Covert we've been talking about. Batch one is the inaugural uh, batch or edition. We'll do reruns of that steel and that that knife in that steel in that uh, that um, that uh, Cerakote color, that that scale material and color. That'll be a rerun batch, and it'll just it'll be a different batch, batch number. Like it'd be batch two if we did one right now. Uh, but we will also do some what we call unicorn batches, which are rare and precious and lethal, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they will be uh, makeups that will not be repeated. So that it could be a, a color Cerakote that will only be one time done with the combination of, of scale materials. Uh, it could be scale material difference. It could be something different and unique about it that will not be that we don't intend to ever do again. And, and you know, we're going to stick to that. Uh, you know, there's a tendency to say you're going to do it. Like they do this in the watch uh, world all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, and then they they go back on that and they end up making it a production. Uh, like, we're not seems, do that. seems we actually made a lot of money on this. We're going to do this again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're we're not going to do that. If we if we do a unicorn run, we actually do have a unicorn batch of the Beckwith coming right now. Um, it's in production right now. Uh, so I was will, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, we'll only do that that uh, that combination of materials and color uh, once, and then it's done. I, I was looking at your uh, one of the pages where you describe how to kind of decipher the markings, and. Yeah on the blade and it's cool you have the batch number you have the um the addition number you know out of how many and that kind of thing um and it looks like on the unicorn edition you might have a little inscription of like a a unicorn on it oh hell yeah we've got a unicorn, it's a unicorn i love edition. it i love it okay because that unicorn i have two daughters and i've looked at unicorns a lot in the last uh, 14 years so i saw that and i was like i gotta have that on my knife somewhere that, that yeah. unicorn looking so Looking so friendly and happy, yeah, <laughs> deceptively deadly. All right. So, uh, Chaz, as we wrap here, what do you and John foresee as the future of Fisher Blades? How do you want this to grow? Well, we just want to keep making knives that have uh, purpose behind them and uh, that, you know, have the quality that we're that we're aiming for and that are made in the U.S. Um, or, you know, or close to it. And uh, we want to keep solving people's problems. I mean, we're really in the problem solving business and, you know, that's what knives do. They solve problems and it could be any sort of problem. And so as long as we are helping people solve their problems, helping them, uh, as we say, survive and thrive, mm -hmm. then, uh, then we're pretty psyched. So that's what we're going to aim to keep doing. Outstanding. Well, I'm, I, uh, um, I want to let everyone know that now that we've had this interview, you are going to be coming on Thursday night knives in, one of the uh, coming episodes and helping uh, to give away one of these. You sent you sent me very generously mm -hmm. a package that we will be giving away uh, to a viewer on thir uh, Thursday Night Knives um, with a Beckwith and a couple of other things that you threw in there. Very cool, including my favorite snack of all time, uh, <laughs> beef jerky. So yeah. <laughs> um, very cool. We, we will announce. I'll make a video announcing when you'll be on and uh, and. Can't wait to be giving one of these away to to a lucky viewer. Uh, Chaz, thank you so much for coming on and talking about Fisher Blades. It's been a great pleasure, sir. Thank you, Bob. Likewise. I look forward to the next one. All righty, sir. Take care. Yeah.
Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. Well, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Chaz Fisher of Fisher Blade Company. Uh, I am loving the Beckwith Covert, and I can't wait to see how this particular line evolves, and, and we'll see what that unicorn edition looks like. No doubt it will be cool and very special with that little unicorn on it. Um, that's what I call cognitive dissonance. Like, no, sir, it's for work. That unicorn... It's just a friendly unicorn. All right. Be sure to join us on Thursday Night Knives tomorrow, uh, uh, this week and Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And uh, keep your eyes peeled for some shorts coming up. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast mm-hmm.